Now, in 2012, uh, an old flower pot that had been used by the kids for a goalpost was sold at auction for uh, £668,000. Oof. Tall and slender, it made a perfect goalpost, but unknown to the family, it had been made, no, been made by a renowned sculpture and had been uh, uh, made for the Paris exhibition of 1864. 668,000 pounds. Just go and look at those flower pots. Now you could say it, could, it, it had been hidden in plain sight. Everyone could see it. But no one knew its true value. Its real identity was hidden. Hidden in plain sight. Well, come with me to Luke chapter 23, to the reading which we had, where something else is hidden in plain sight, unseen, unrecognized. Have you seen it? Now, as you read Luke's account of the crucifixion, what's striking is just how many people are involved. It's a public execution. And we can identify five groups. So number one, there's Simon of Cyrene, verse 26. Now, as they led Jesus away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, Jesus has already endured the unendurable, beatings, whippings. He's been caned around the face. They've driven onto his head a crown of thorns. And then out of that, the blood loss Jesus is exhausted, too exhausted to carry his own cross. And so Simon, a Cyrenian, is on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He finds himself a pilgrim in a very different sense. He's press-ganged into following Jesus, into carrying that heavy crossbeam. Well, second group, number two, the daughters of Jerusalem, verse 27. And a great multitude of people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented him. It's enough to make anyone weep. Jesus, it's a tragedy. The innocent charged as guilty. The one who loved at all times treated as a terrorist. And you can see them there looking and how can this happen? And as they watch his faltering steps, and he stumbles and he falls, and they witness the blood streaming, his body broken, his face unrecognizable, they're deeply moved. But look at Jesus' response, verse 28. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren. Wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Now what does Jesus mean, verse 31? For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now remember, Jesus was a carpenter, so he knew all about green wood and dry wood. Green wood is straight from the tree. It's heavy. It's full of moisture. And it's hard to burn. It's too wet. By contrast, dry wood has been seasoned. It's half the weight. Uh, it's lost most of its moisture. And when you put it on the fire, whoosh, it's what you need for your log burner. It burns very well. So what's Jesus saying? Is he a violent rebel? Is he the leader of, a, of an uprising against the Romans? No, he's the, he's the Prince of Peace. He's the Greenwood. So if the Romans are treating the innocent Jesus with such brutality, what will the Romans do to the Jews when a generation later they do rise up against the Romans? What will the Romans do when the wood is dry? And of course the answer is they will show no mercy. 
their judgment, their retribution will be swift and brutal, and it was. In AD 70, Jerusalem was utterly destroyed and the slaughter was unparalleled. The sheer crucible, the cauldron of suffering. Because the Romans were determined to teach this nation once for all a lesson that would never be forgotten. And it was a bloodbath. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. Of course, they'll be saying in those days, blessed are those who have no children, because they will be spared the sight of seeing their children slaughtered. Verse 30, then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Rome's judgment upon the nation will be so furious, so final, the people will beg to die. So as those moved with emotion, at the sight of Jesus' sufferings, he turns and says to them, weep for yourselves. He's moved with compassion for them. Because judgment is coming. The judgment day is coming, and you will not escape. Well, what's the third group? The Roman soldiers. Verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they, that's the soldiers, crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, the crucifixion isn't described. It was a death by a thousand deaths, and the aim was to prolong the death agony for as long as possible, to extract every last gasp of suffering. So here are men whose job it is to crucify people. That's their day job. Now think of it. What does it do to you? To nail a man to a cross, to hold him down, and to tear his flesh, and to ignore his screams and his cries, and then to keep him company, and because crucifixion is not a quick death, to keep him company for hours, until either he bleeds to death, or he can no longer support his weight on his arms and legs, and he, he suffocates under his own weight. That's your job. Now, what sort of... What does that job do to a man? So is it any surprise these men are completely indifferent to Jesus? Look at the end of verse 34. They divided his garments and cast lots. Having stripped Jesus naked, they're gambling for his clothes. Utterly unmoved. And, of course, crucifixion, as we said, it's not a quick death, it's a slow death. Not only are they unmoved, they're bored. As far as I can see, here's another Jewish troublemaker. They're probably fed up with policing this nation because this nation always seems to be on the, on the brink of rebellion. Maybe these soldiers have lost friends in this sort of guerrilla warfare that was taking place at the time. And this one, this one thinks he's a king. So let's have some fun. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Can you see them? They're coming and they're offering Jesus cheap wine, sour wine. They're putting it on a sponge. And as they put it to his parched lips, just as his lips are about to get wet, as he tries to, 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 to suck the sponge, they move it away. More wine, sir? Have some wine. Not so much as a, a drop of drop to cool his tongue. And what does Jesus say? Verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Well, there's a fourth group. There's the ruler of the Jews, what we might call the establishment. And they're loving this. Jesus was a threat. He was a challenge to their power. And it's turned out so much better than ever they could have expected. Because now he's been crucified. 
crucified as an, as an unholy criminal. And they're loving it, the irony of it all. The one who called, the people thought was the chosen one. The shame. Look at him, he's, he's ludicrously naked. It's a, obscenely naked. He's a ludicrous figure. He'd been abandoned by his disciples. And of course, nailed to a tree. We all know what that means. Curses everyone who hangs on the tree. Abandoned by all. Abandoned even by God himself. And you called yourself the chosen, the Christ. Whoever will believe you now. Verse 35, even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Go on, prove to us you're the Christ. But you can't, can you? You can't save yourself. Because you're not the Christ. You're just scum. You're a blasphemer. You're a liar. You're getting what you deserve. Despair and die. So four groups. Maybe those four groups are here. Is there a Simon of Cyrene? You know, you're dragged along to church, usually by your parents. And you feel put upon by your Christian mum and dad. Forced to come. Forced to follow Jesus. And you can't wait to get rid. So a daughter of Jerusalem... The cross, the sufferings of Jesus, makes you emotional. I have a friend, and when she comes to church and sings the hymns, she cries. When she watches the sound of music, she cries. Are you moved by Jesus' sufferings? You've never wept for your sin. That sin should cost him so dear. And you've never wept for yourself that the judgment of God is coming and you're not ready. Is there a soldier here? You couldn't care less about any of this. In fact, you're bored stiff. Now, someone published a list of uh, 50 boring things including traffic jams, that's fair enough, isn't it? Slow Wi-Fi, uh, buying socks. I, I quite like buying socks. <laughs> People telling you about their dreams. I thought we all nod, we'd all nod that one. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to you, isn't it? Actually, when you get halfway through telling someone your dream, you actually think, actually, it's not very interesting, this dream, is it? But it seemed important at the time. And number 50 on the list was, was Alan Titchmarsh, which I thought was a bit unfair. <laughs> well, maybe you put on your list someone talking to me about Jesus. Maybe. Think about it. Perhaps the, the quickest way to clear a room is to talk in a loud voice about Jesus. You find yourself very alone very quickly. Is there a ruler here? Somehow Jesus just brings out the worst in you. you. You feel that somehow he's going to spoil your life. Somehow he's going to try and take over. So hearing about Jesus just sort of winds you up. You don't, you don't really quite know why, but it just, it just gets you in a way that nothing else does. And like the rulers, you find yourself sneering, scoffing at all of this. Four groups. Which are you? Four groups who fail to see what is hidden in plain sight. Who fail to recognize who this man is. Four groups. But there's a fifth. Because there's one person who sees what no one else has seen. He does recognize who this man is. He does see his true identity, his true worth. Of course, it was written, written up all the time. 
hidden in plain sight. Verse 38, this is the king of the Jews. It was there for all to see. So who is this fifth person who sees, who recognizes, who understands? He's one of the criminals. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed Jesus, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And that is verse 42, isn't it? Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you finally become king. He sees what no one else sees. He recognizes who this man really is, that this is the king, the king of the Jews. Or maybe you're thinking, well, I'm none the wiser. Well, there's more to this title than meets the eye. Prophecies spoke of the king of the Jews. And those prophecies said that his rule won't be limited to the Jews. That he will be the king to end all kings. In fact, he will be God's son. God himself, clothed with glory and power, whose kingdom will have no end. And he'll rule over the nations. And he'll bring the blessing of God to the families of the earth. And the king who will mend the broken relationship between God and us. And who will put this sorry world right. And he will make all things new. So much so that this is the king who will banish even death itself. And the king to whom ultimately every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that he is Lord. Remember me when you finally become king. Jesus, the king of the Jews, hidden in plain sight. But you see, no one looked less like a king. Because his identity is buried beneath layer upon layer of humiliation and shame. This is the last place you'd expect to see the king to end all kings. Hanging on a cross, suffering, bleeding, dying. This, this is the king of the Jews. And yet when you understand that, it's like everything drops into place in the narrative. The narrative begins to make sense. You see why Luke has put things as he has. Look, look at verses 26 and 27. Here's this great number. There's, there's a Simon from overseas, from North Africa. He's come. He's now a pilgrim following Jesus. But not just him. There's a great crowd following Jesus. And we see it's like a royal procession, a procession of honor. This great crowd, Simon, the soldiers, the rulers... Men, women, following, following the king, the king crowned with thorns. Verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Not just a procession of honor, there's now a throne of honor. And they seat the king upon a cross, and seated with him on either side, a criminal. Verse 34. And they divided his garments and cast lots. There's also a guard of honor. A guard of honor. Accompanying the king. Keeping watch. But gambling for his clothes. And verse 36. The soldiers also mocked him coming and offering him sour wine. There's also a cup of honor. And here comes the royal cupbearer, offering the king to taste the wine. But it's sour wine. It's the cheapest wine. It's the wine you give to the poorest of the poor. Whoever saw a king like this? But there it's written, this title of honor, this is the king of the Jews. 
Do you see? They turn his glory into shame. And yet as Charles Spurgeon says, it glands the eyes of saints and angels, world without end. This, this is the king, the king of the Jews. And yet even on the cross, the king is reigning. The king who delights to show mercy. Father, forgive them. And the king who on his way to his enthronement in glory promises a place of honor and blessing to the one who asks, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Assuredly, I say to, do, say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the king of the Jews. We close with two things. The first is this. If Jesus is the king, why is he nailed to a cross? What's going on? Now, Jesus is dying the death that's reserved for the very worst. It was reserved for criminals and terrorists. It was reserved for those that society was glad to be rid of and rid of forever. Verse 32, he's, that he's being led out to be put to death. And this was the death that was seen to be appropriate for rebels and terrorists. That's what you did with them. And yet Jesus is, is innocent. And says the Bible, that's the point. Because the real criminal is me. The real rebel is me. As far as I'm concerned, God doesn't own me. God can't tell me what to do. So here I am living in God's world, enjoying God's blessings, living entirely for myself. Free to do as I please. And God's gifts have taken the place of the giver. I've walked out on God. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. I don't want a Christ-shaped life. I don't want a Christ-shaped future. Thus says the Bible that for every act of rebellion, for every crime against God's law, just as in this world, where if you break the law, there's a price to pay. When you break God's law, there's a price to pay. And that price is the wages of sin is death. That's the price to be paid. But upon the cross, Jesus pays that price. He dies that death. He takes the place of the guilty. And he suffers for the rebel's crime. The religious were horrified when they saw Jesus mixing with sinners. Eating, drinking with sinners. In fact, they said, oh, he's the friend of sinners. But in his love for rebels, his love for sinners, to rescue them from sin and death and hell, we didn't expect him to go this far. Yes, to eat, to drink, to welcome, to stretch out his hands, but not to stretch out his hands upon a cross. To go to a cross, to be condemned in their place, to die the punishing death they deserve to die, for God's judgment to fall upon him and not them. For him to die the death that's appropriate for rebels, so that we, the rebels, because that's who we are, might be forgiven. So that our crimes might be paid for, that God's justice might be done. And therefore the offend offender can go free. That's how big his love is. That's how far he will go. That's why we sang, how marvelous, how wonderful. It is love to me. 
Those rulers said far more than they realized, didn't they? Verse 35, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. But that's exactly the point. If he is to save others from the judgment of God, he cannot save himself. Because someone's got to pay for the crimes. And so he's wounded that we might be healed. And he endures shame that we might inherit glory. And he dies the sinner's death that we might enjoy eternal life. And he's surrendered to hell's worst that I might attain heaven's best. He's the humble king who loves his people and gives himself to save them. This, this is the king of the Jews. So as we close, how then would we respond to the king? Well, you've seen there are four wrong ways to respond to him, aren't there? Simon, apologies for all you who call Simon. But you know, Jesus the effort, Jesus the pain, Jesus the dead weight. Is that you? The weeping women. Jesus' sufferings, they move you. But you've never wept over your sin. You've never once looked up, up to see the approaching storm. Can you not see it? You can discern the face of the sky, can't you? You can see when a storm is on its way. But says the Bible, have you looked up to see the storm that is coming, the wrath to come? Or the soldiers, you're just bored, bored, bored. Looking at your watch, maybe half turning around to see what time it is. Come on, finish, let's get out of this place. Or the rulers, you know, just Jesus brings out the worst in you. So go on, scoff, sneer. How should I respond? Respond to the king hidden in plain sight. Well, as we said, on that day, one person did recognize him. The youngest believer in the world. A condemned convicted terrorist and he does respond in the right way and he does show us the way there's that criminal verse 39 saying if you are the Christ save yourself and us but he steps in doesn't he what does he say but the other answering rebuked him saying do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong what does he see on that day? He sees his sin. That he's not just broken Roman law, he's broken God's law. And at the judgment, there is no way he can prove his innocence. He's under God's death penalty. He's a man condemned to hell. And he fears. Good, healthy fear. Verse 40, do you not even fear God? Have you seen your sin? Do you take it seriously? You've broken God's law. Maybe you say to yourself, well, pff, God's not that big a deal. You know, I don't mind coming. I don't mind talking about him. But he's not that big a deal. No offense. But of course, in your life, other things are a big deal, aren't they? And those things which are a big deal are bigger than God. But what does his first commandment say? It says, you shall have no other gods before me. Nothing is to be a bigger deal than God himself. So you've broken the biggest law. The first one, the biggest one. And that's why the judgment, there's no way you can prove your innocence. 
you like this criminal, like this terrorist, are also condemned. And it's God's death penalty. You're condemned to hell. Do you fear? He asks a straight question, doesn't he? Do you fear God? Do you not even fear God? Well, do you not even fear God? What he sees is sin. He sees something else. He sees there's no way out. Do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. We're getting what we deserve. What can he do? He's, he's, he's sinned. He's broken the law. Justice must be done. He's in free fall. He's got nothing to hold on to. He can't relive his life, can he? He's nailed to a cross. He can't undo the wrongs. He's nailed to a cross. He can't look on the bright side and tell a joke. And there is no religion or philosophy in the world that can save him. What advice would you give to him? Well, what would you say? And faced with the same judgment and the same outcome, are you willing to take your own advice? Well, if you've got nothing to say to him, or if you know that your advice doesn't actually make any sense, throw it away. Do you know what makes you special? Evolutionists say what makes you special is your opposable thumb. All right, your opposable thumb. I wonder what an opposable thumb was, but your opposable thumb, it opposes your four fingers. Okay, your fingers go the your fingers go that way and your thumb opposes them. That, they say, is the secret of our success. That's what makes man great. That's what gave us an edge over our primate ancestors. That's why you can open a door, tie your laces, drive a car. That's what makes mankind stand out above the rest. You have an opposable thumb. There lies your greatness and success. Will that do when you come to die? When you go to eternity via the judgment? When you're on your deathbed, you're going to say, opposable thumbs, I'm fine. You see, it's hopeless, isn't it? Every religion, every philosophy, everything that's pumped out and we're told has no answer. Have you seen there's no way out? So he sees that he's sinned. He sees that there's no way out. There's nothing he can do. He can't rescue himself. No one else can rescue him in that sense. But then he sees something else. He sees the king. He sees the king who loves to forgive. Father, forgive them. He sees the king who is innocent. This man has done nothing wrong. And he sees the king who saves others by the sacrifice of himself. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ. But that's the point. To save others, he won't save himself. He sees the king. He looks at the king, the way the king dies, the man that he is, he looks and he bows and he trusts and he speaks to the king. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what will the king say? Surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, because the king of love dies for the crimes of his people, even a terrorist, he can say to this man, no condemnation, no death penalty, no hell. 
I'll bring you safely through death and I'll bring you to glory to be with me, to my kingdom, the kingdom that will outlast all other kingdoms, even Rome, the kingdom which will conquer all. Surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. One old preacher said, today, what speed? With me, what company? In paradise, what joy? And the point is this, the king hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So have you seen your sin? And have you seen that there is no way you can sort this out? That you're going to the judgment, you're going to eternity via the judgment. It's only going to go one way. Well then, have you seen what's hidden in plain sight? Have you seen the king? This is the king of the Jews. Dying on a cross for sinners. So look. Look. Bow. Trust. Speak. Lord Jesus, you died on a cross to save condemned sinners. I'm a condemned sinner. So save me. Forgive me. Remember me. And the king is here tonight, ready to show mercy, willing to save everyone, everyone who calls upon him, including you. But never forget there were two criminals. One near to hell who went to heaven. One near to heaven who went to hell. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Lord, we bless and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the King who is mighty to save, the King who saves to the uttermost all who come to him. Our God and Father, we pray that the power of the cross would draw us irresistibly and that we might find life life, eternal life, this night. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.